of course, it's political season, but these defections have been on for a while. You would think that Congress had its worst election in the 2019 uh, Lok Sabha election, but things have actually gotten worse since then. Um, do you think this is the end of the, the grand old party? Nobody in Tamil Nadu has come out protesting, saying, give us Kachiti back, you know. How dare this this island be ceded away and so on and so forth. And it is carried by by, by India's largest news English newspaper saying that, you know, this is this has happened and everyone's somewhere like, yeah, you know, it's happened. I mean, fifty years ago. So that's that's a startling political reality. I don't think it's really sort of paid off. The chief minister of Maharashtra, he was standing on stage wearing um, you know, a stole uh, that basically had the BJP logo on that. Now imagine what that means for his party workers. Hi, welcome to the 11th episode of the India Dialogue. We're so excited that you're willing to give us a listen. My name is Ruchir. I'm joined by my wonderful co-hosts, Mitali and Manu. Mitali Mukherjee, besides her being a director of journalism at the Reuters Institute, she is well known for her work at CNBC. Manu Rajshan Mugan Sundaram, or Manu, is not only a successful advocate with his own law practice, but he's a spokesperson for DMK. And I am the CEO at Distributed Energy and chair at the School of Policy and Governance. We're doing this because we care about India and want to discuss issues in a way that adds value. For now, this is an experiment we want to run in the build-up to the 2024 national election, which is, I think, almost about a week away. Elections are almost here and we're unpacking issues that matter. Maybe we continue after, maybe we stop. We're excited to cover two issues today, starting with defections in election season. Um, There have been many defections to the BJP in the last 12 months, especially from Congress. Jairam Ramesh famously recently made the comment of, uh, he used the metaphor of a washing machine to criticize former Congress members who have defected to the Bhatia Janta Party. He suggested that these leaders who are facing allegations of corruption or other charges are joining the BJP to cleanse their reputations implying that their legal troubles and the stain of corruption are being washed away upon joining the BJP. Of course, there have been more defections than just those facing charges, including but not limited to Jyoti Raditya Sindha, our friend Anthony, there's a whole long list. So let's dive dive in. Um, My question, and I'll start with Manu, is um, Manu, of course, it's political season, but these defections have been on for a while. You would think that Congress had its worst election in the 2019 uh, Lok Sabha election, but things have actually gotten worse since then. Um, do you think this is the end of the the grand old party? Um, are, is there anything that Congress still stands for, do you think? Well, uh, there are many ways to look at what is going on, uh, because we are in election season Let's look at it through a electoral slash political lens, right? I mean, people are, I think, free to, by nature, to resign from and join another party and uh, pursue their sort of political ambitions. But, uh, you know, there is a particular sort of pattern and uh, the general sort of understanding is that people will join a outfit or an organization which is sort of on the up and up, which is doing well, which has promise uh, and a secure future. And you... You have to look at, you know, maybe that is partly also, you know, politicians being political and uh, smart enough to read which way the wind is blowing. They are probably trying to uh, get on a a ship that will end its course, you know, and reach its shores. So as opposed to jumping off a sinking ship. Now, your question is sort of, you know, formatted or formulated as if is Congress the sinking ship people are jumping off and that. I don't know. And to be honest, I think there's a lot of defections even from the BJP or at least some from the BJP towards the Congress. Now, politically speaking, you know, though it is a national election, uh, the larger question is in each state, how are the sort of undercurrents playing? And there are states where Congress is strong. You know, if you take 
Telangana, for example, or Karnataka, for example, in recent years, Congress won, you know, very, very uh, strong mandates in these two states. And naturally, you see a lot of people going from different parties towards the Congress. But however, I do, I do, you know, concede that there are enough number of Congress persons or other party persons also gravitating towards the BJP. Uh, the other, the other important or interesting issue that we must look at is how is some of these defections happening, right? I think just as we are speaking a little while earlier, um, sitting minister and MLA of the Aadmi Party has resigned from the Aadmi Party. Of course, this comes against the backdrop of at least three ministers, Satyendra Jain, Manish Sodia, and of course, Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal being arrested, a member of the Rajya Sabha from the Amadi Party, Sanjay Singh, was arrested and recently released uh, by the Supreme Court. And all of them have been arrested by the uh, Enforcement Directorate in, in cases to do with money laundering. So it, uh, it raises another question, right, which is the use of enforcement, law enforcement agencies in sort of facilitating or catalyzing these defections. A few days ago, the Indian Express published a, a fairly sort of scathing piece on uh, where they looked at the 25 politicians uh, against whom various uh, criminal cases, especially money laundering or serious criminal offenses uh, in, involving corruption were lodged, filed, instituted, but never taken to the logical conclusion for I think around 22 or 23 of them because after subsequent to the institution of these cases, they moved and joined the BJP. I mean, the very sort of simple um, uh, coming to mind immediately examples are Praful Patel, uh, Ajit Pawar, uh, I think Chagan Bujbal, uh, quite a few from Maharashtra at least, right? The very sort the, the common joke is that, you know, when you first uh, go to an enforcement directorate inquiry, at least the joke in the last one year has been, they give you two options. They say, you know, if you touch this finger, you go to BJP office headquarters, or if you touch this finger, you go to the jail. Like, what do you want to, you know, because uh, we can't tell you what to do, but you can tell us what, and then we will try to help you out. You know, seriously speaking, I think this has been sort of a, a pattern which is now established, at least, you know, with somewhat empirical evidence by the Indian Express and other journalists who have been tracking it. And, you know, I think the arrest of Arvind Kejriwal also was interesting. I know I'm moving away from the whole washing machine concept, but, you know, I think it is interesting because we've seen, uh, you know, this is the second chief minister to be arrested by the enforcement directorate in the last six months. First being Heyman Soren, uh, chief minister of Jharkhand as he was then, and now Arvind Kejriwal. Um, both of them are still in jail, uh, and this is peak election season. So it, it has every possible uh, potential of backfiring quite heavily against the BJP. We will not know until the election results come out to understand how people have understood these uh, arrests. But I've never, I don't think any of us have seen such high profile arrests or action against uh, senior sitting constitutional functionaries, you know, especially the chief minister. Arvind Kejriwal case, I just want to mention something which I found very interesting, which is that I've never seen uh, any sitting politician argue their own case, right? And I think that's an important point because I think it is a recognition that Arvind K. Jiriwal at least sees this as a political issue, not a legal uh, proceeding against him. Though it is factual that it is a legal proceeding against him, he is saying, no, no, I, this is political, so I will argue the case, right? It's okay, I know I have access to the best legal representation, but I will take this on. I will tell the court, I will tell the people of this country why this is a very, very political act against me, my party, and, you know, maybe even the larger uh, alliance which he belongs to. So going back to your question about, you know, the defection, yes, you know, uh, around the time of elections, there is a greater sort of um, magnitude or the greater sort of attraction towards defection because your, your, your distance between leaving your party and contesting an election is very short, right? So you don't have to work for years in a party and then ask for a ticket. You will say, look, if I leave party A and come to your party B, will you give me a ticket in, in two months' time or in a month's time and so on? But the larger problem for those candidates is always is that, you know, how will they be perceived? Because the local party cadre would not have had the time to sort of build chemistry, right? Or gel with that candidate or, you know, sort of 
and there would have always been a alternative uh, party candidate who has been dislodged from that seat. So it, defection, I, I don't think always works. I don't think it's always successful. There was once a time when I think around uh, 14 or 15 um, uh, MLAs defected in Karnataka uh, around the time, you know, when the first Congress JDS uh, government about four or five years ago was uh, pulled down. A lot of them, I'm told, I, I'm given to believe, uh, faced election under the BJP with the BJP ticket in the recent Karnataka elections and lost, which which goes to say that, you know, obviously the local BJP, the part, the people who were in those electorates did not think or approve of their uh, defection. So I think uh, it, it's something that is very, very closely linked to political outcomes. It's hard to tell, Ruchi, whether uh, the Congress or any other party, just because, you know, people are defecting will be substantially weakened. Sometimes... Uh, and I, I will close on this. Sometimes it's a good thing to lose the extra baggage, right? If somebody is defecting, somebody wants to leave, maybe it's a good thing, right? Don't hold them back. You know, they, they're already, their mind is already out of the door. So maybe best to just let them go and not try to sort of force them to stay with you. Mitali, can we zoom in on that point of voter trust? I mean, in a democratic process, especially... Um, I mean, I guess a lot of these defections are closer to election, but what is the impact um, of these political defections? I mean, often these defections are overnight. How do you go from criticizing a party to joining or how does a party accept someone who was criticizing them um, just yesterday? Yeah, um, it's a great question, Ruchir. And I just have a couple of, you know, few quick sort of top level observations. And then to your point about voter trust, which I wanted to talk about in a, in a slightly different way. The first thing is that this has echoes of the electoral bond experience, right? Because the, what what is leaving a bitter taste in the mouth here is the quid pro quo nature to this. And it seems like the exact same uh, formula is being played out in the political arena where, I mean, you know, Manu mentioned the fingers. There's a couple of jokes saying, khud ko bachao, BJP jao, essentially saying, save yourself, go to the BJP, uh, which, which makes it so transparent uh, about what's going on here. There are allegations. The only way out of the allegations is not to fight them. Uh, it's that either you go to jail or you join this party. Uh, so I think that's it's pretty apparent. Now, whether or not that becomes an issue of voter chooses to hold their own candidate accountable to, we can't answer for them. The other one, I think, with the, which the BJP will have to start grappling with very soon. And at this point, of course, there's a lot of, you know, sort of strength in, in the organization. So it's not being criticized for it. Is its, is its own attack on dynastic politics. Um, I think if you were to sort of, you know, start tracking how many of these exits from other parties and into BJP are people who are from a family of politicians, uh, you know, you will find that a, a large part of that list is actually dynastic politicians. This is the own BJP uh, line saying that's what they're against, that's what they're fighting uh, to, you know, pull pull away from, that's what the Congress tried to build. So I think at some point, uh, if it's not in this election, it will come up soon saying, well, hey, let's look at the structure of your party and uh, who does that constitute? I think for the point you made about the Indian National Congress, it's uh, there's a broader criticism and this criticism has been around for a while, which is that often party members have felt representation in terms of seat allocation has not been fair. It's been quite centralized, which it is for the BJP as well, but it doesn't give full credit to those who are genuinely sort of ground up workers for the Congress party. And I think, you know, maybe some of that rancor has built into these exits. Uh, there were two recent exits from the INC and both actually mentioned the fact that they didn't get on with the head of the of the media outreach, Jairam Ramesh. Uh, you know, so they're being very vocal about it, but there are obviously sort of differences building up. It's a different it's a different measure, of course, that, uh, you know, you don't hear this from the BJ, BJP side, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But in the Congress, people are vocal about what their differences are. And the final point I make, I'll make is a, is a slightly different one, which is not about people joining the BJP, but people choosing to partner with the BJP and what the consequences of that as well may be. And I think Maharashtra is a great example of that. You know, you're so many frictions opening up within that, uh, within that hodgepodge chemistry that's going really of the government in power. There was recently a rally that was held where the Prime Minister was there, several members of the BJP, and of course, Eknath Shinde, who is the 
supposedly the chief minister of maharashtra but he was standing on stage wearing um, you know a stole uh, that basically had the bjp logo on that now imagine what that means for his party workers and what that does in terms of sending a message as Man- manu was saying you have to start thinking about what at the granular level of uh, the kind of party base you're trying to build whether as an individual leader as a partner or as you know fully within the bjp party so i think you know some of these things are going to start are going to start building soon on your point about voter trust you know i just want to shift this a little bit i don't know if you know you, you caught it and i would encourage our listeners to je- to, to definitely go up and read about it the hindu which is you know one of the biggest newspapers and news organizations in india released a a low a low priti csps poll today on what voters see as the biggest um, issues going into elections now 62% of indians said that getting jobs has become more difficult over the last 5 years uh, 71% of indians believe that prices have risen compared to the last 5 years ago only 1 in 5 indian households feel that they have now or are at a point where they earn enough to save after taking care of household requirements and you're seeing that in falling savings deposits 55% more than 50% believe corruption has increased in the last 5 years again this survey shows that this issue is more acute for muslims it's more acute for the backward castes it's more uh, you know acute for the dalit community the adivasi community whether or not this becomes a you know an issue on which someone chooses to vote again i can't speak for every individual voter but i think it's a really glaring reflection of what the the core problems are and in the run up to these elections from january to now just think about what has been you know in the mainstream consciousness we started with the ram temple then we moved to you know all sort of opacity around the electoral bonds no it's not a bad idea now you know, the whole uh, terrain is about this one quit and that one joined and this one quit and that one joined i don't think you've heard anything tangible about uh, you know these core issues the last time round we had a guest on our on our on our podcast we talked about election manifesto correct me if i'm wrong i still haven't seen the bjp's election manifesto um so you know uh, i think some of it is subterfuge uh, in terms of you know building a really large narrative around issues that should not be issues um and i'd be curious to see whether people finally start voting on the issues that matter to them which is socio economics and that does begin to pinch but versus I, i mean things. obviously we've discussed the media situation in the country but some of it doesn't it go to the lack of a cohesive narrative from the opposition are like are we stuck with the gandhis and that is part of the is that part of the problem that um, there is no um, strategic leadership from the opposition to opposition to paint uh, uh, an alternate vision uh, meaningfully and, and like why i ask I, let me frame this differently i i sometimes wonder that a lot of the defections are because of the lack of cohesive leadership in the opposition um you know there is this famous i have this private story from a name brand politician who said to me um even if i wanted to lead the congress look at what happened with ysr's death in andhra everybody showed up at his son's place the next morning um and and, and that's is that challenge uh, most politicians in congress cannot overcome um and that means that we don't actually have a uh, leadership that we all deserve uh, in the opposition um like i i i hear both of you around you know obviously bjp has been a um, Uh, a bit of a bully in terms of getting people on the other side but what about the fact that there is nothing holding them in the opposition today i'll take this one chief because i think you know uh, the question about an opposition cohesion or opposition narrative is something that has been repeatedly posed and uh, i think it's worth understanding it in that context right uh, according to me i i i like this old saying uh, because i think it's old and true which is that uh, oppositions never win government's rules right why because it is but it is truer in india than in any other democracy because uh, government in india today as they are they control everything they control uh, government they have you know disproportionate influence in with the media independent agencies law enforcement agencies autonomous bodies like the election commission and so on right 
now we have openly seen you know the prime minister campaign around religion now campaigning uh, around religion on religious lines or communal lines is actually uh, written as a corrupt practice a practice disallowed by law i cannot go and say please vote for me because i am you know part of this religion and you're all part of the same religion and only i can say you whereas the other person the other candidate is from a different religion but you know any religion camp religious campaigning and this is being done repeatedly by you know not some uh, you know lower level political person but someone as you know well uh, carefully sort of followed and uh, recorded as the prime minister so i think you know lot, lot of this sort of narrative around the opposition has been made and yes um, could the opposition have had a a prime ministerial candidate and still have faced these criticism and questions possibly could the opposition uh, have done more sort of coordination meetings and sat together on on stages and held more rallies and still this narrative could have been set possibly right like i said that that's 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 a fair and it's a fair um, criticism maybe if that is what people want if people say no no we want a prime ministerial face otherwise we will not vote for you uh you know the, la- the if you know if any survey shows um that the biggest problem that the people have with the opposition today is lack of prime ministerial candidature or prime ministerial face then that's fine but partly building on mitali says i don't think that's the problem today right i mean elections are about issues i don't think a person coming in as a prime minister chief minister or any any role will necessarily address these issues what the opposition should be questioned about is have you provided an alternative road map for india or have you provided a, a, a alternative vision uh, you know in terms of what you would like to do as opposed to the bjp i think to some extent congress has put together a great manifesto i think there's some interesting points there yeah, as we expected it's very welfare is you know it, it there is a lot of premium on federalism uh you know it's it's less centralizing than what you would expect from the bjp we don't know what the bjp is going to announce my uh my i i'm given to understand that bjp will release the manifesto before the first uh, phase you know begins which is the 19th so around the 16th or the 17th because after the evening of the 17th there's what is called a silence period here so you cannot really campaign but you know that we we've not seen um the bjp the, the the party that has led india for over the last 10 years as mithali said even put out a manifesto so we do not know what the bjp vision is of course we spend a lot of time discussing manifestos but uh, i think it, it would have been instructive for us and the voters at large to understand what is in the mind of you know uh, supposedly india's largest political party right and what they have as a vision for the next 5 years we don't have that but yeah some of the criticism against the opposition for having to having failed to be more cohesive be more sort of um, you know clear in their plan of attack is partly there uh, i concede that there is some merit to it but overall i think what the opposition has done is they've played to the strengths right and i mentioned this in one of the earlier episodes too we've seen that in uttar pradesh akhilesh is taking the lead we see in bihar tejasvi is in maharashtra it's a bit more sort of equally split between the ncp the uddhav and the congress but i mean i think i would still say uddhav faction shiv sena has taken the lead of course in tamil nadu where i am from the dmk is the leader so i think they they so now understood that they have to play to their strengths i don't think they the 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 opposition alliance is going to spend too much time worrying about some states where the bjp is expected to sweep according to me gujarat uh rajasthan madhya pradesh you know these states i think it's 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 quite clear bjp will do really well but in other states where there are other players uh, i think there is a little bit better cohesion at least in the ground level you know even if it doesn't seem so uh, on, on the front pages of the major newspapers you know with all the leaders holding each other's hands i think there is some level of chemistry amongst these parties and they all understand and they've been working together at least for the last uh, eight or 10 months so uh, i think that's that's where uh, i think things lie and i want to sort of you know ask you both because you're both living overseas now right so and i know some of our sort of listeners also live overseas um, and uh, we sort of 
Tell, tell us, tell, tell us a little bit about the difficulty in you know in getting to vote or or trying to vote. Um, Bitali, do you want to just sort yeah. of tell us how how easy it is to go and vote when you're living not in the country? I will, uh, and I just wanted to finish up one point from this discussion, Manu, and then you know tell me my my voting uh, story or my voting attempt. One thing that I will. Uh, I think credit should be given uh, to the BJP is being extremely astute, and and this is slightly separate from sort of you know people going over to the party. It's extremely astute political representation, and this is why it has worked as a, a very powerful force, particularly in large cities in northern India, such as Uttar Pradesh, certainly in Bihar as well. You know, a lot of times people ask, "There's abject poverty." It's clear this is happening with. Uh, Cast lens to it. Why is it that the backward class still remains quite a large voting base for the BJP? And I think in that the BJP has played its card very, very well in terms of political representation. And this is when you go all the way to the extremely backward class in states like Uttar Pradesh and in Bihar as well. Uh, you would have seen the largest jump in terms of political representation happen when there was a BJP government in power. What is tactical over here is the fact that many of these positions are not core positions. They are not finance. They are not, uh, you know, uh, strategic in that sense. They could be ministers of state, or they could be slightly more, you know, milder portfolios to put it like that. But if you compare it even with parties that are meant to represent these backward castes, including the Samajwadi Party, there is not enough political representation. It is most often skewed either towards that particular caste in, uh, you know, in specific. Or certainly towards the upper caste, and I think the promise of that has a pretty potent factor, particularly in some of these North Indian states. And you know uh, that credit has to be given in terms of very, very astute management on how to how to play this politically uh, as well for leaders. And maybe that is something that is appealing to people when they move from one party to the other. On my uh, election expedition, Manu, it was so far. You know, it's sort of a bracing impact with India's uh, technological uh, prowess and development. I went on the election website. There is a particular form that you have to fill, and I would say you should have leisure at hand when you're filling that form because it's it's you know it's it's not a, a, a short uh, an attempt or a, a process as you may expect. So very very long process. Lots of capture codes. Um, lots of information asked for, including who is the person in India who is going to vouch for you. So you better you know someone better like you a lot uh, <laughs> or have no choice. Um, so you know that that happens. You fill out a long form. You in all your details, where you live, all the information that can be given, all that information then has to be provided in sort of paper form to the person who is going to vouch for you in India, and the election commission officials will come visiting. They will check for that paperwork. After that, frankly, I'm a little bit blurry because there is no booths uh, available as they are uh, for many other countries. Maybe it's uh, postal votes, like it is for you know people from the military, etc. But I'm still waiting. Uh, you know, I, I'm I'm registered in Delhi, so I have a little bit of time, hopefully. But I have not heard anything yet about that. Ruchir, how has it been? For you? I was just planning to go to Gujarat and uh, cast my vote in Ahmedabad, uh, uh, even though it wouldn't matter. But anyway, this is the luxury of the <laughs> you also just fly down and vote. <laughs> I, I, I um, but anyway, I like yeah. I have it previously. I have missed voting because we don't have boots internationally and it's actually surprising because uh, bjp uh, loves nris i'm surprised they haven't done um, um, international boots here absolutely i think postal ballots would be the easy way to do it people who are unwell elderly last time uh, during the covid uh, election season so in 2021 in tamil nadu people who were infected or suspected covid could apply and you know you, they would get a postal ballot so there are there were ways and means to sort of uh, extend the postal ballot system to NRIs, people living overseas. I'm equally surprised. There is one uh, point I think in 2022 or 2023 January, if I recall correctly, where the minister in charge had given an answer in Parliament saying yes, we are considering and we are working with the election commission. What people must understand is 
according to articles 324 to 329 of the constitution the election commission is an autonomous independent constitutional body so they can actually and rather they must take the lead right so the government can only say look tell tell us if you would like to do this we will assist you we will extend the services uh, of our personnel in in you know in various embassies high commissions around the world but the election commission must do it and Election right. Commission, as you know, is run by three people sitting in Delhi. So uh, whether they would, I don't know why. What what's made them not do it yet? Uh, yeah, no. I, I... Mean, they have one point four billion people to worry about. The twenty five million are yeah. losing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. but also increasingly one of the largest expat communities, right? That's so, right. Yeah. No, I would love. I, yeah. yeah, in our right communities. Uh, shall we switch to the next subject? No. Let's do it. Okay, let's go island hopping. And this time we are talking about Kachipibu, and I hope I'm uh, pronouncing it correctly, Manu. Which is just to give our listeners context. It's a small island, a strip of land, uh, basically, which is in the Park Strait, dividing India and Sri Lanka. And uh, from whatever I've read, there was a lot of conflict around fishing rights uh, in that island for a long time. But way back in 1974. that this court was ended when the indian government relinquished any claim that they had to the island uh, and india and sri lanka signed an agreement that sort of prevented people from uh, both countries from fishing in the waters that belong to each other essentially and uh, now it seems to have come back to life in the recent run up to the elections where the indian prime minister has accused that the then party in power the congress um, sort of gave the island away to sri lanka um, that was uh, You know, and India was wronged in that process. Uh, Manu, you're the expert here. A, what's happening in terms of whether this is really creating debate or discussion on ground, and B, why now? So uh, let let's look at it from three three sort of stages, right? First is around Kachitiwa. Second is around politically what it means, and third is sort of. Uh, a global perspective, like India's own neighborhood foreign policy, right? And what this sort of, uh, so I guess, a take uh, the Prime Minister's take on Kachitiwu means for our foreign policy at large. So, firstly, see Kachitiwu, entirely fantastic sort of description and background context setting. One one key word which I would add to what you've said is it is it has always been uninhabited, right? So no one has lived on this strip of island, right? So. typically that's the whole game people are not even drinking water right manu that's what i read yeah right right and the only sort of uh, structure there is a, a a church right and i don't think it's in fantastic shape but it's called the st anthony's church once a year people from tamil nadu and sri lanka go to the island and celebrate the st anthony's festival so it's almost like a temporary uh, religious spot but they come back right so nobody stays there so who really you know uh, owns or or has control over kachitiwu something which was never clear from the ter- in, from the sense of any you know people having possession over that piece of land but interestingly you know earlier earlier meaning the 18th century 19th century documents showed that it was part of the zamindar of ramnar right so in 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 southern southeastern tamil nadu part of their sort of because um, at least that's how it has been recorded but we at least bear in mind at that time it was british india british ceylon so they must have thought what's the big deal anyway everything is you know under the control of the crown so it doesn't really matter now uh, after independence to both countries you know and and fair development or evolution of international law uh, you know there's a concept of how much of the territorial waters right comes under the country's jurisdiction i think it's around 14 nautical miles so 14 nautical miles from every the coastline of any country is there the country's jurisdiction it's our territorial waters and uh, now the problem is the park strait as you said mitali is is so small that kachitiwa comes in both our territorial waters right so who does it actually belong to this is something which is a a, a sort of a semi legal uh, problem which has always plagued the two countries and just to sort of put an end to it to give it some clarity uh, the governments and and this is after numerous discussion between foreign ministers of both governments they finally sort of uh, exchanged letters so it is not 
technically speaking like a bilateral agreement but it is constitutes an agreement between the two sovereign powers where it says that the kachitiv for all practical purposes because nobody is living there uh, comes under the sri lankan control but tamil nadu or rather indian fishermen and sri lankan fishermen will shall continue to enjoy their traditional uh, slash customary fishing rights which really was the you know the the, the core issue because people are worried that you know the the the, the coast of kachitiv which was rich in you know fish um, would be sort of made uh, you know no, no, people would not have access to it so uh, the fishing rights were protected by the 1974 agreement and subsequently there was another agreement in 1976 further clarifying the same now this being the background of kachitiv and the fishing rights and everything and clearly in the definitely as far as i know having you know living in tamil nadu for the last you know 6 years and you know being around for the last 40 years nobody in tamil nadu has come out protesting saying give us kachitiv back you know how dare this this island be ceded away and so on and so forth and certainly you know we were all quite surprised and shocked that the prime minister you know in the end of his 10th year heading the government suddenly you know had a realization that kachiti was no more part of india because it is something that happened 50 years ago so something now we all accepted it to you know though you know we i think ideally we would like to keep every extra piece of land to ourselves i think we all come to terms with it so now you know to sort of suddenly say hey hang on why it was kachiti was given after being control of the government for the last 10 years after having and led numerous you know uh, bilateral discussions and delegations to sri lanka and the other way and engaging not only with the sri lankan government but recently couple of uh, maybe about 4 months ago uh, indian government has engaged with the major opposition party in sri lanka as well they invited their leadership to delhi and so on just to show you know going out of their way to do everything to be you know uh, on good relations with sri lanka so it's it's quite you know startling that uh, suddenly this realization came to the prime minister around the middle of march right 2024 and even more interesting that it, this came up because uh, his own bjp tamil nadu chief his bjp tamil nadu president had filed an rti and typically you know as a lawyer i file quite a few rtis to get information which otherwise government denies giving us and it takes as i tell tell my uh, colleagues my clients that it will take you between 60 to 90 days to get a response right and, and and a response not even like the actual answer to your question but just to say we we've got it we're looking into it it can take about 45 60 days at the very least but uh, the bjp president who filed the rta got a response along with all the documents in 5 days you know and and this is in uh, between the 5th and the 10th of march and you know typically most government offices today you go anywhere in tamil nadu they say no no we have election work don't trouble us you know come after two weeks come after six weeks right so quite interesting you know how quickly he was able to get this information and this is really the the crucial part after getting this information that kachitti was ceded away which pretty much all of tamil nadu knew for 50 years and has come to terms with and have accepted as reality he proceeds to not inform his prime minister his party leader or the home minister or the external affairs minister right come on i have this great information 50 years old as it may be but we must do something he goes to times of india and says please carry this you know this it is exciting information from 50 years ago and it is carried by 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 india's largest news english newspaper saying that you know this is this has happened and everyone some was like yeah you know it's happened i mean 50 years ago so that's that's a startling political reality i don't think it's really sort of paid off political paid political dividends here because like i said it is not it's, it's such a non issue here i mean you've not seen fishermen or 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 tamils coming out and saying how can this happen and you know why why was this given because like i said they are happy the fishing rights are there and of course anyone would like kachitivu uh, return to india but you know interestingly what this has led and this is the last part of my uh, piece here which is that you know it is sort of muddied the 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 you know the, the the relationship we've had with sri lanka the sri lankan foreign minister has responded and he's like well come on this is a settled issue what are you reagitating this for and sri lankan politicians are now up in arms saying 
what is india trying to do are they saying that they will take this back i mean sorry you can't do that we won't you know stand for it and this is the same week when arunach in arunachal pradesh china had apparently uh, renamed 30 uh, areas or regions in arunachal pradesh gave them chinese names and said you know essentially claiming uh, chinese sort of um, a title or ownership of these places right i mean again like i said and we've discussed you know uh, indian foreign policy in the context of maldives and other places before and i think it's really sort of varying for two reasons one i always you know said this in a in, in a non critical way like in a non sarcastic way that i give credit to the prime minister for having made foreign policy part of our domestic political discourse not too many governments before this had done that and you know because the prime minister was so keen on you know establishing global leadership and all of that or india as a, a soft superpower and so on but really the indian neighborhood foreign policy i don't think has suffered so much like i mean sri lanka is one of the few countries we were on good relations with i mean definitely not china definitely not you know pakistan afghanistan maldives you know some say even bangladesh has like a you know get out india or uh, india out campaign going on now similar to maldives but you know again sri lanka was one of the few countries so i don't know exactly whether this was a, a well thought out plan of of political campaigning or something that is only for short term political gains in tamil nadu if it is the second then it's there's nothing that can be worse right because there are few things we say and i think the the the, the famous sort of example that someone told me was in the past i think narsimha rao asked uh, vajpai to lead a delegation you know uh, to do with in, in with, with a key foreign policy issue now you know th- that level of bipartisanship was there earlier you know um, india sent you know opposition leaders to the united nations to represent india but here you sort of have like the uh, in, in exact opposite where the the ruling party is using a particular foreign policy issue for its own political gains and i think that will damage india's credibility on the global stage more than any other sort of war and i mean the worst thing about this is the flip flop right i mean 50 years we've accepted that kachitiwa has been given to sri lanka and now to sort of you know reclaim it or restart this issue no country will will come to support us nobody right in the global arena if this is sort of the flip flopping that we are doing on something as simple perhaps even some would say as inconsequential as kachiti because there's, there's nobody's claim that you know it's such a strategic piece of land that india must have it so well, no, i think I, look, there is an international policy perspective. Let's come back to that. The question on the politics of it right now is um, um, anecdotally, it's clear that um, uh, BJP is pushing hard to have a better play in Tamil Nadu, um, also Kerala, and so on. But um, you know, one of the things I remember about the Gujarat election was the media was like, "Oh, AAP is going to do well. Everybody else is going to do well," and everyone on the ground was saying, "Hey." there is no chance like bjp is going to win everything like what is the situation in tamil nadu especially because you're based there um you said that fishermen are not up in arms about this then why is this i mean i consider them to be smart people like why even bother uh, bring this up i i have two possible sort of uh, uh, i guess options one is they needed some issue right and they were looking they were really sort of clutching at straws here they were looking for something that ticks a few boxes like nationalism patriotism like the uh, the 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 you know let's attack the gandhi family because because it was indira gandhi who signed that letters in 1974 so partly that you know and bring this back to congress uh, and and dmk was in power in 1974 not in 1970 when the second agreement was signed because there was emergency declared between those two agreements but in 74 dmk was to say that you know let's tie this around like right? dmk congress patriotism giving away land doesn't care for fishermen who are a marginalized community and and really they didn't have any other issue right which we discussed in the earlier segment to like what are the issues at play is unemployment something we're talking about is how is india's gdp something we're talking about is even ease of business something we're talking about is is corruption something we're talking about no we're talking about defections we're talking about these kind of issues which 
maybe BJP thought that, you know, uh, perhaps, you know, and, and this is interesting, when, when the BJP leaders, especially the Prime Minister comes to Tamil Nadu, he doesn't talk about the Ram Temple, but uh, a few days ago when he was campaigning in the north of India, he spoken that, you know, uh, Congress did not come for the Ram uh, Temple uh, event, inauguration and uh, consecration event. So, you know, that shows how anti-Hindu they are. So, I think maybe they're trying to figure out what is the right sort of issue that can be raked up, can be agitated in Tamil Nadu. The other one is, like I said, it almost matched the timeline when China was sort of, you know, doing this in Arunachal Pradesh. So, were they sort of trying to, you know, break this up to give deflect it? And also the third issue, perhaps the third way I look at it is, you know, um, the opposition alliance, as you said in the earlier segment, Ruchir, uh, do they have a cohesive narrative, right? Are they all attacking BJP for its failures in the last 10 years? Or, you know, the failures according to them. And maybe they're starting to do that. And then in order to sort of, you know, quickly change the topic and shift attention, you know, you bring up a non-issue. People are suddenly like, oh, we have to respond because, you know, the Prime Minister has spoken about it. Uh, Jay Shankar, the Foreign Minister, has actually spoken about it thereby contradicting Jay Shankar, the Foreign Secretary in 2015 when he's given an answer directly opposite to what he's saying now. But, you know, people are starting to like sort of shift attention from uh, the 10-year rule to now, you know, this, right? Again, you you speak about the Ram Temple in the North and instead of talking about whether BJP has delivered what it promised, you know, is there a bullet train between uh, Mumbai and Ahmedabad? People are saying, no, no, see, why should we all go to the Ram Temple? Or, you know, he, who, who, who gives a certificate on Hinduism? So the, you know, are they getting you to play the game that they want, right? Uh, maybe that is another thing that the BJP sort of spin masters and, you know, sort of spin doctors are uh, are sort of hard at work at is something I wonder. Uh, Mitali, do you see this sort of um, differently from a sort of a media observing point of view about how political spin happens when issues uh, are not sort of quite uh, landing at the, on the spot. I think I'm intrigued to see how um, what the performance looks like this time round, Manu, because uh, as you said, if you were to use the barometer of sort of socioeconomic welfare, it's no, it's no um, secret that the states in southern India are going to come out far higher, you know, and Tamil Nadu might well be right on top of that list. So that's not something that they can be attacked on, right, that they haven't provided uh, jobs or, or, or food grains or primary education. Uh, some political strategists have pointed to the possibility that this could be the best ever performance for the BJP in a state like Tamil Nadu, uh, you know, sort of besting what they've done in, in the past and moving far higher in terms of total seats that they win. Uh, so I wonder if, and again, I'm lobbing it back to you and I'm sorry to lob it back, but I wonder if, you know, you, you think they they feel like they've got, just like in West Bengal, they feel like they've got the beginnings of something that they would like to build and scale. And maybe this is just experiments saying, let's give it a shot, you know, let, let, let's see where this lands. I think it may very well be. And uh, perhaps, you know, BJP is always known to play the longer game better. And uh, I don't know if they're that, the, their vote shares will increase in states like Tamil Nadu, I have no doubt, because they do start from a very low uh, uh, threshold, right? So in the 2021 election, I think the BJP vote share is around 3 to 4%. So it, it needs, it must, it has to come up. It cannot go down. They do have a, a fairly decent alliance. Of course, they don't have either of the two major political parties, the DMK, ADMK, but they have a few other smaller parties and they're hoping, you know, they will contest in more seats and grow their, uh, grow their percentage. But don't forget in 2014 was actually a very good uh, uh, election year for BJP in Tamil Nadu, though they, they, they only won uh, one or one, one, two seats, uh, you know, one BJP and one alliance, they won, they actually got 18, 19% in Tamil Nadu. So that was a good um, percentage year, but even though the seats come down, the problem is because 20, like in 2014 and again in 2024, what's happened is it's multipolar. So there is a BJP alliance, which is, let us say, the third 
for most popular the first two would be the dmk led and the admk led right by sheer arithmetic if you add dmk plus congress the muslim parties the communist parties and all of that that actually is you know 35 to 40 around 38 to 40 percent in a three way race you don't need you don't need more than 30 percent right so it's it'll be very difficult even if bjp gets 10 or 15 percent which is a huge uh, push and i think the best uh best sort of survey result for the pre election result has been around 17 18% one of the media surveys gave them but even if they get that admk will definitely get 25 plus or 30 plus dmk will get 35 plus the alliance at large and between dmk and admk you know there may be a few seats given to each other but beyond that i can't see bjp winning seats sending members of parliament from tamil nadu however like i said in the long game in the lo- in the for so in the in the long sort of uh, plan long term plan that's that's good you know they will say look we contested alone we got a good percentage now they will go back in 2026 my guess is to one of the two parties probably the admk because they have better relations there and say that you know uh, take us on board you know and and campaign hard and is you know, that that is like a it's not a 10 year strategy it's a 50 year strategy to you know towards forming a government in a state like tamil nadu where they you know to be fair not one many seats at all so it is it is very much part of that but coming back to kachitivu i think it 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 will be a non issue i don't think they've picked the right issue i don't think they they figured out the right issue in tamil nadu you know it's it's a very odd state in that sense you know it is like a temple tourism capital you know like many other parts but it's a lot of temples uh, they, they you know tamils are devoutly religious you know as religious and as any other sort of linguistic community but still you know they don't understand why bjp doesn't hit the mark there right and often i think a few people have tried to explain this as some sort of you know rationalist religious beliefs right like they will they will do all the religious rituals but then they will come out and they will say no no you know uh, we should send you know uh, we should uh, send girls to school we should make sure women you know get into every job uh, we should be there cannot be any discrimination along gender lines along caste lines they will support a person like periya ramasamy who you know was atheist but also you know fought enough for say female uh, empowerment literacy Uh, even fought for you know people abolishing caste names caste markers you know 100 years ago so i think D- bjp has not yet found the issue and maybe they're still grasping on you know around to see what will help them succeed in a place like tamil nadu not even succeed what will make them you know quite relevant in terms of the new cycle here uh, but ruchit i want to ask you this though. like you know somebody who has lived you know overseas for a while but you know uh, is from gujarat and you said you were going to go and vote in ahmedabad very soon when you read about kachitivu being sort of suddenly coming up in news what was your first sort of thoughts you know un unadulterated by my comments and perspectives i i thought of two things one was the instinctive or oh, like this is another jab at uh, the congress because i mean bjp is really good at that i mean they they've been in power for 10 years but they still talk about congress is corruption for 60 years or 70 years or whatever so 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 that was the first instinct and the second instinct was um, i thought about um, i don't know if you've heard it's a little esoteric there's this term called salami slicing about china which is um, you know bit by bit china tests its borders and so i was thinking oh, are they like thinking about testing india's borders with sri lanka it surprised me because it's not india's style it's not india's way but uh, that that's where my mind went when i was thinking about uh, this comment i think um, i was so grateful of the numbers you just laid out in terms of the voting percentages because it sort of gives a lot more color um, i think there is something called cultural intelligence in our political system that's a lot more uh, prominent and important than in a lot of other political systems because so many of these states are so different from the other um and and i don't think um bjp meaningfully has the cultural intelligence in the south in the way it does in the hindi belt i think that's the gap here 
anyway very interesting well f- f- fantastic no i i that's an interesting way to look at it, the cultural intelligence piece and maybe it's something that as the elections progress we can test this theory throughout to see whether you know the cultural intelligence of the different states and how the bjp sort of uh, fashions or engineers its campaign around that but shall we move to have you heard uh, because you know it's it's that uh-huh. time that time <laughs> of the podcast um so the have you heard is is a place where we talk about interesting snippets uh, stories uh, events in our lives from the last week or something that we read heard or noticed in our lives which we thought was worthwhile sharing uh, may i start first i uh, noticed from a picture last week there was a photograph uh, and this is again on sports i saw um uh, djokovic meeting rohan bopanna and djokovic had recently become the oldest uh, singles men's number 1 player in the world beating a federer record i think federer was 36 djokovic is almost 37 or just big turn 37 and bopanna is the oldest ever uh, tennis men's tennis number 1 doubles player at 44 uh, so you know you have a 37 year old male singles tennis player 44 year old males uh, you know doubles men's doubles uh, player and it's fantastic to see them doing it i think it just shows i mean more than anything that people uh, you know the longevity of 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 the uh, you know the players now in sports right and I'm very close to my own sort of uh, self you know i been watching the chennai super king space so you have dhoni on the other hand right again i think 42 or 43 and still looking fit as ever and so it's it's great it's it's inspirational um, you know for people around my age to sort of look at these guys and play at such a high uh, competitive level so do you want to go next richir on your have you heard so um um recently apparently the story is not that new but if you'd heard of the amazon go stores in the us where there are all these cameras and you can just walk out with the groceries the idea uh, there was that um, all of these cameras scan what you have and uh, based on what you're carrying whether it's in a cart or not um when you enter you already have your credit card linked to you so they charge you as soon as you walk out and it sounded like really cool technology the future of uh, shopping and so on turns out and apparently this was also reported in 22 but i just spotted it now turns out about 700 out of every 1000 transactions required manual re- review by a team in india and they had all of these people actually very fast <laughs> selecting what uh, type of deodorant you actually picked up or what type of uh, what vegetable you picked up um and the thing is they never corrected which was the most amazing thing they never corrected all this um, uh, news reporting that went out saying oh they have this amazing artificial intelligence technology to scan um, what you pick so so um, anyway it's technology surprises you uh, some things are still far behind uh, and we still uh, uh, you know rajat was talking about ai replacing all these jobs it's not quite there yet Anyway, that was my happy heart. Very interesting. I wonder if there was a capture code involved as well. That's my new. That's my new thing to hate. Capture. <laughs> I am taking the liberty of doing two. Have you heard today? Uh, and my first one is you heard about a really, really cool and amazing journalist called Rukmini, who first wrote this really fantastic book about data in modern India, and you know lots of interesting stories there. and has now launched something called data for india which is a fantastic website and i would encourage you all to go there and just play around with it a little bit there's so much rich information on employment on women women and employment on population uh, play around with it uh, it's not just sort of pure data the idea is that this is telling a story in itself there's a very proud husband uh, somewhere in this in this uh, video call who's nodding his head but uh, you know the, no no shade to manu this is like such a fantastic project and all best wishes to rukmini and her team and i think if you know if you enjoy reading data storytelling i would really encourage you to go and and check that site out and my second have you heard 
is a film that I watched, uh, which was out a long time back, but I watched it only recently, which is The Big Short. Um, and I've had sort of the stock market on my mind. So The Big Short basically is about the global financial crisis and what went down at that point. But it's not just about the crisis. It's about these three or four really intrepid um, investors who could see this housing crisis building and had the foresight to go short on the market. Um, it is really fantastic for, for two reasons. One, because it's a window to what was happening on the other side. Two, it has simplified what was a, and remains a really complex subject around, you know, subprimes and what all that means and ratings in a, a really interesting fashion. And three, I think it's such a good mirror to what remains the underpinning of the financial world, not just in India, but globally, which is greed. Uh, there is so much greed underlying, you know, how we approach uh, investment calls. And I think w one line really struck with me, which is, you know, when one of these persons going short is having a meltdown at, you know, how can you do this? And how can you be loading on all this junk into the system? He just, you know, he just says, you're never going to answer for it. The people that are going to answer for it remain folks who took a mortgage out and are going to have to live in their car for the next uh, many years because they'll be kicked out uh, and they won't have a home uh, and their children won't have a school. Uh, and I think, you know, that that's a, a real reflection of, uh, of what happens often in these really large sized explosions. So I'm really happy to see that the Indian stock market is doing so well. But I'm a little worried about who finally has their fingers burnt when 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 the tide begins to end. We should cover it maybe in a future episode. Thank yeah, you sure. both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, wonderful. Have you heard Zapne Sunakya? That's the end of our 11th episode. We'd love to hear your thoughts on how we can do this better. Share your feedback at indiadialoguepodcast at gmail.com. We do get a few emails and we're grateful for those of you who send them. Thank you. Find any of us on X formerly Twitter. Um, the podcast is at TID, the India Dialogue, TID underscore podcast um, on Twitter or X, India Dialogue podcast on YouTube. Manu is at Manuraj1983, Mitali at Mitali Live, Ruchir at Ruchir underscore P. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again in a week. Thank you. Bye.